everybody. This is Arwen Lewis, and you're listening to The Arwen Lewis Show. My very special guest today is Emily Duff. Emily Duff um, is a longtime icon of New York City's Rook Rock community. Emily Duff has spent her career blurring the lines between rock and roll, soul, roadhouse country, and punk. She's been a solo artist, a bandmate, a multi-instrumentalist who strums a guitar, plays the cello, and writes her own string arrangements. But above all else, Emily Duff has been and always will be a songwriter. If you ain't composing, you're decomposing, she says. I like to keep myself moving and keep myself writing. I usually write one song a day. It's been that way for years. Duff's songs emphatically nod to the sounds that first captivated her attention as a child during the 1970s. Raised in Queens and Long Island, she gravitated toward the era's roots legend and soul singers, Chris Christopherson, Aretha Franklin, Willie Nelson, Janis Joplin, Johnny Cash, Al Green, and countless others. Don't Let Go turns that rich tapestry of sound into fuel for something original, with Duff delivering a collection of heartland rock anthems, folk songs, barn burners, gothic murder ballads, soulful love songs, and everything in between. If Duff's previous albums explore different corners of her musical personality, the muscle, muscle shoals-sized R&B of Maybe in the Morning, the gospel grit of Hallelujah, Hello, the punky rock and roll of Razorblade Smile, her newest work returns the artist to her roots. Who exactly is Emily Duff? She's a street-smart New Yorker who traded mixtapes with Lou Reed during her 20s and struck up a musical partnership with Gary Lucas, the experimental guitarist who performed with Captain Beefheart's Magic Band before launching his project Gods and Monsters. When the band's original lead singer, Jeff Buckley, left the lineup to launch his meteoric, um, yeah, meteoric solo career, Duff stepped in as his replacement. Before long, she's left that band and formed another group, uh, Eudora, whose mix of Americana instrumentation and Baroque textures earned them a gig opening for Bob Dylan and Paul Simon. But despite the momentum, Duff longed to do something even more personal. And by the time she launched her solo career during 2000, she'd already lived a life rich in experience and eclectic music, which lent a mature perspective to her songs. Rolling Stone magazine describes Emily as one part Muscle Shoals, one part Patti Smith, and No Depression describes her as a roadhouse punk rocker. The Clash meets Jerry Lee Lewis. And today we're featuring songs from her albums, Razorblade Smile, Hallelujah Hello, and her EP Tonight. Welcome to the Arwen Lewis Show, Emily. Hey, how are you? What an impressive biography I was able to share with you. or with oh. everybody. <laughs> I was actually even a little bit impressed by. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to start talking about some of these things. Um, I thought we could start by telling our listeners about how your musical journey began. Uh, you're a guitarist, a singer, and a cellist. You write your own string arrangements, and you're a songwriter. So how did all of these talents come into fruition for you, and what was your musical education like? Well, my mom was... Uh, pun intended, instrumental in getting me playing in that she uh, played folk guitar. Okay. And uh, from the time I was very young, I picked up her guitar. She taught me four chords and then I took it from there. Oh, and wow. then okay. after that, I just played every instrument I could put my hands on. I played, you know, I played mandolin, I'd play bass, I'd play drums, I'd play cello, I played violin and trombone for a little while. I just wanted to play a little bit of everything because I heard music all the time. That's And that's so great that you were able to transpose everything to all of these different instruments. Um, it sounds like you're both a colorful musician and a colorful songwriter uh, with many different genres, of course, which is awesome. And you generally write a song a day. Um, how long have you been writing at that pace? And what's your songwriting process like? Um, the process changes, I'd say. The, the process really is to, to follow the song. So more than songwriting, I, I would call it song catching. Okay. Um, and it's just about, like I said, hearing music in my head at all times and constantly being surrounded. I mean, I wish I could 
turn around and show you that we live we live in Manhattan and we live in an apartment that's 340 square feet. It's very small. Mm -hmm. And there's four of us, 20, about two dozen guitars and a hound dog who's actually spazzing out right now on the carpet. <laughs> um, so there's instruments and there's um, there's inspiration everywhere. So every day I wake up and I reach for a guitar. And I constantly wake up with ideas and I love words. Certain words lend themselves to melody and certain rhymes just bubble to the surface, you know? So the process will change. It'll be me playing guitar, strumming along, hearing a melody, starting to sing. Uh, you know, there's legend has it that Paul McCartney and, and John Lennon used to use the word scrambled eggs, uh, like to fill in you know, it, for melody that those were just the words. And um, you, you just kind of hum along and do the things you need to do until the story or the, the mood finds itself, you know? So process will change every single day. But at that, pace, have, yeah. at that pace, probably since 2015. That's, that's impressive. And what made you decide you wanted to write songs? Did you feel like you had to, or was, you know, well, you wanting to add to your music? Well, I, I've, I've always thought that storytelling was probably the greatest art form and live music, I think, is what all art forms aspire to, mm -hmm. because live music engages the audience and all the participants in the art form itself. And we're all experiencing it in real time. You know, when you're playing with a band, it can be dangerous and sexy and exciting and fun. And you're having a conversation in a completely different language. And when you do it live, you're letting people watch. So it's voyeuristic. And when I say sexy and dangerous, you could be doing, you know, a song and you could be really at a pace where it feels like the wheels are going to fall off at any second. And it's just amazing when it doesn't. You know what I mean? And everybody's kind of on that ride. Everyone's riding the same wave. So it's it's participation and it's community and it's excitement and it's all happening in real time. So telling stories through music and doing it live for me, it's like it's you know, it's like Philippe Petit walking the wire between the two towers. You know, it's that performative thing, but it's also a meditation. And everybody gets to do it at the same time. I like how you said meditation because it's, you have to literally be in the moment, right. And be mm -hmm. mindful and have that conversation, you know, just bouncing off of each other. Like you just said, I really like that metaphor when you're, um, I'm a yoga teacher, so oh, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, play so music. You know, you know yeah, what yeah, it's yeah. like. Um, and so about playing with people, do you write songs with people too, or? Um, I've written three songs oh, okay. out of the 800 some odd songs or 900 songs in my catalog or I don't know how what what really I haven't counted them lately but I really I, I create in isolation usually because yeah. I there's, there's so much happening in right. my head um and it's very difficult for people to move at the same pace I, I would love to write with other people you know and it, it's something that I've almost done 50 times where somebody has said, oh, I want you to go here or go there. And they're looking for a writer and just what you need. But I've never, you know, gotten into those rooms with people. But I'm, I'm sure that if I got in there, it would be it would be exciting and fun. There's nothing not fun about writing songs. Yeah. And I mean, it just I think it's easy to definitely like create in your comfort zone. Right. And um mm -hmm. I've, and, and you know you're not having any problem coming up with great material <laughs> on your own so if it ain't broke don't fix it right um what about composing strings do you compose strings for other artists or do you just do that for yourself too I have done for other artists but I haven't in a long time mm -hmm. um it's something that I look forward to doing again um and scoring and you know writing for tv and film um uh, and it'll happen it has happened in the past it just hasn't happened in a little while yeah. And I guess with the strike, maybe, you know, hopefully it'll end soon. And then maybe I can get back to doing something like that if I'm needed. And when you say composing, like, are you just composing like string arrangements or are you doing song like, you know, like um, pop songs for TV? Both. When, oh, both. Okay. Both. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. 
Um, and let's talk about your album Razorblade Smile oh. featuring um five songs from that uh record today. Um so like did you have a particular writing process for this album? Did you write the songs for the album or did you go through your catalog and choose uh the ones that fit together? That album was really interesting because I recorded it during the pandemic okay. and uh recorded during a time where people weren't getting together. So I went over to my producer's studio, uh, Eric Amble, Roscoe, okay. everyone knows him as Roscoe. And um, I recorded just uh, acoustic guitar and vocals. Okay. And then he built the tracks around because at that point we still weren't supposed to be getting together, right. you know? So then it was, you know, farm it out and do this and get a band together. And, you know, he would do that at another time and then we would do overdubs. So that was a really interesting process. That was the first time I'd ever made a record like that. Huh. It's not the way I'd like to make a record because like I said, I love live music with people because it is, you know, it's for me, it's a, you know, it's a community thing mm -hmm. and sharing. Um, but it's, it's one of my favorite records because it came out feeling, uh, very alive and especially knowing how we made it it was a real it was a, it was a surprise and it felt really good and and all of those songs I wrote for that record you did except okay. for razor blade smile that that had already been written so did that kind of spark um I think the, so in, okay yeah What's, I think that, that that was the record the song that I used kind of as a centerpiece okay and what's the meaning behind that title um, razor blade smile is kind of like that smile that you put on when you're, you know, you're gritting through, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's kind of, it's, it's not fake. It's just, you know, I'm just putting this out there and maybe I'm not happy with everything, but I'm just, I'm, I'm going to get through it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was, you know, a message we needed at that time for sure. <laughs> Yeah. And also still staying resilient and tough. Right. You know, and firm in who you are. And um, also, I feel like that was that's a really good message just to send out. And you're such a great an expression of that because you have so many um, genres that you write from and create in. And how about um, the musicians on this record, too? Like, did you have a group of people or was it primarily just you and your producer that played the instruments on the record? Well, no, it was interesting because Roscoe um, has a bunch of people that he loves to work with. Mm -hmm. Now, Roscoe plays all the electric guitars on this because why wouldn't you have him? He's so great. He was Joan Jett's first guitar player in the Blackhearts. Cool. So he was 19 and they were all out in LA and he was in the band and Joan broke and it was a big deal. And I love rock and roll and that's Roscoe, you know? Yeah. So, um, so he's fantastic and he's got a great sound and he's produced some of my favorite records. Keith Christopher is on bass. Uh, Keith is uh, presently in Leonard Skinner as the bass player. Wow. Um, <laughs> Phil Cimino <laughs> is the drummer. He's unbelievable. And I've worked with him before on a few things. And Roscoe's worked with him before. My uh, bandmate, Charlie Giordano, who happens to be also in Bruce Springsteen's band, he plays all the keyboards on this stuff. And um, yeah, and then Cody Jensen, we, we just sent this out to him and he did a, a pedal steel track for us. And that came out really nice. And Roscoe's wife, Mary Lee, um, she and Roscoe do all the background vocals. Okay. So, yeah. So that, that was the, the personnel on that record. And, uh, you know, it, they're, they're so amazing, you know, they're such hot shots and they're such great players. Why wouldn't you be excited to make music with them and make records with them, you know? Yeah. And like, do you, I'm assuming you probably just give them free reign. You're like, these are the cores, these are the changes play what you hear well that's roscoe he's the okay. producer you know okay, what i mean so it's all like, his. And, and i trust him and i think he's one of the most talented people i know and he's really generous and he understands like he really gets it he's a great producer I, this is my the ep that i did with him was the third project we worked on and it's interesting because when i had my band eudora i wanted to work with roscoe back in the 90s oh, wow. i think it was back in 1990 seven or eight 
I really wanted to work with him. And then, and things got really strange with my guitar player at the time um, who wound up like having a bad drug habit and stealing a bunch of money. And so the record didn't get made and I never got a chance to work with Roscoe, but then I finally worked with him in 2019, 2020 on born on the ground. So that was, you know, I don't know, 30 years later, we finally got a chance to work together. It's funny so, how things work out that way. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, you get there when you get there. Yeah. And how about um the recording uh material or recording equipment? Was it all digital or analog or a little bit of both? Do you have a preference? Um, on, on well, you know, I love analog and I'm not, but I'm not a purist, you know. I'm not gonna say, oh, I need to work on tape because it's it's so easy and it's such a such a luxury. I love technology for certain things. Yeah. You know? And there is an and but I'm actually a Luddite. I worked in the tech in the technology space back in the 90s. Oh you know? wow, okay. Oh yeah. I had started an internet company back in 1998. Oh, and, so in the yeah. very beginning. In the very oh, beginning, I was working in that space. I started an online magazine called Silicon Sally. And we were promoting visibility to women who were working with emerging technologies. And it was really exciting and I love doing it, but being such an early adopter, an early adapter to all of that stuff, it, it sort of turned me off like around 2001 when everyone started taking off. I decided yeah. to back up because um, I saw the problems, the inherent problems in creating spaces that were echo chambers. And it's like, I feel like I like I a lot of artists have a love hate relationship with it. Right. And like you sure. probably it gave you the chance and to make your record that yeah. way with all of those people and during that time, too. Um that yeah, I know it's a it's a blessing and a curse. I think I'll agree with you. Yeah, there. yeah. And if you have um, a great if you have a great producer, a great engineer, and also a great mastering engineer who might be able to take your digital mixes and you know and put them through tape, you know, and yeah. give them a warm sound, uh, then you know you're getting the best of both worlds. And I have had the privilege of making two records, both recorded in Muscle Shoals at the legendary Fame. Uh, recording studio and those both wound up on vinyl so you know I understand the richness of that that process but it's not you know it has to be one way or the other because it's it's financially not viable I mean to make records like that is very expensive mm -hmm. and in a world where people don't think they need to pay for music it just it the, you know the 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 pros and cons don't they just don't balance Totally. And like, I, I think a good way around it, like you said, is like re recording digitally to save time and money. Right. And then mm. like, if you can transfer it onto at least tape with the mastering engineer and get it on the vinyl, because then I mean, you, you I guess you can tell there's I mean, for me, there's definitely a difference between like a 60s vinyl listening to that on my record player and sure. like the current one. But it still sounds warmer on vinyl, like if it's been mastered to um, tape than it would like on a CD player, like we're playing it off the MP3s right. in the car. Exactly. But you can't be a snob about things like that. You know, there's there's just no way to, you know, to yeah. say you'll only do it one way. It's just ridiculous. Um, who who mastered Razorblade Smile? Um, Razorblade Smile was <laughs> was mastered by um uh God, Richard Dodd. Okay. Now Richard, Richard Dodd is amazing because <laughs> Richard Dodd um was a recording engineer. Um, and I think people primarily think, remember him and go, oh, he was the guy who engineered the Carl Douglas song, Kung Fu Fighting. Uh, yeah. he did. That's awesome. <laughs> He's brilliant. He's brilliant. He's done some great stuff. Um, and Dodd really gets the job done great. And he gets it done quick. I, I love working with him and he and Eric have a wonderful relationship. So that makes sense. Nice. Yeah. Um, well, and talk about another legend, Roseanne Cash. Um, I want to share something that she said about you. Um, she said that you remind her of some of the great, earthy, big voiced root singers she loved in the 70s, like Tracy Nelson, Marsha Ball, and more. And that you borrow from that blues and roots tradition, but make it your very own with your sensitive and personal lyrics. So you've got a big and colorful music musical personality. 
and um and you've also you've released albums in uh r&b soul punk and rock and roll um so yeah like how did you become so versed in so many genres i think growing up i was born in 1966 which i consider mm -hmm. to be the golden age of songwriting you know and so my sensibility is still like so heavily grounded in the brill building you know yeah. so and 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 those songs what which what i would consider pop songs yeah borrowed from all of those genres like you know you would listen to great am radio especially here in new york you know uh cousin brucey or you know i don't know if you know our radio you know this is east coast radio and i don't know what radio and when you grew up but listening to you know music on the radios in the back seat of my parents' car, you know, we listened to Clarence Carter on pop radio, listening to songs like Patches and Bobby Gentry doing Ode to Billy Joe. You know, mm -hmm. you know, it's it was it was this pop sensibility that was rooted in classic, what we would call classic rock, R and B, soul, country, now Americana, gospel. You know, we had I I feel like we really blurred the lines when it came to pop music in the 60s, 70s, and even the beginning of the 80s. Yeah. And I feel like nowadays, too, like as we evolve, you know, in pop culture, it's um, all of these genres are kind of coming together. And it's like Americana has kind of like become that. Right. And so you kind of consider yeah. yourself Americana artist. Yeah, I guess people like to say that I am uh, that or a roots yeah. roots music artist but it's you know i i don't know yeah non-binary yeah. musical genre <laughs> yeah i like that that's the new one yes you never yes. coined that yeah, well, yeah we're gonna um get ready to head out to break really quick here emily this is so fun talking about your philosophies and your music um and we're gonna take everybody out to break with my misery from your ep tonight and then bring them back in with you better believe and uh, we'll be right back, everybody. This is Emily Duff on the Arwen Lewis Show. Find her on Facebook under Emily Duff, on Instagram at Emily Duff Band 211, and look her up on Bandcamp at emilyduff.bandcamp.com. We'll be right back. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go run and check on the time with the, my producer in the other room. Okay. I'll be right back. Sounds good.